thank you very much. Welcome to the afternoon session of the Kansas Court of Appeals today. We only have one case left on the docket this afternoon. The other two cases have, one was continued and the other settled. So um, unfortunately we don't have three today, but uh, we do have uh, three more cases tomorrow morning. We are very happy to be here at Johns County Community College. Um, I am Karen Arnoldberger, the Chief Judge of the Kansas Court of Appeals, and I'll be presiding over the proceeding today. To my right is Judge Henry Green, who hails from Leavenworth and has been on our court for 24 years. Um, to my left is Judge Pat McEnany, who has been, he won't reveal how long he's been on the court. We just know it hasn't been 24 years, <laughs> but before that he was a judge on the Johnson County District Court for many years. Um, I am particularly happy to be here at Johnson County Community College today because I am uh, a former alum of uh, Johnson County Community College. I uh, came here after I graduated from Shawnee Mission North High School, um, as did my husband. And uh, we both enjoyed our years here at Johnson County Community College very much and thought it gave us a great um, head start to our careers, me at KU and he at Baker. So um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, for the uh, parties, I'm going to ask you to state your appearances in a moment. Um, we usually advise counsel at this point in time that we are well familiar with the facts of your case, so you do not have to go over those in any detail because we've read the briefs and in some cases we've read at least parts of the transcript in the case, so we're well familiar. But because we're here with a group of students today who are interested in learning about the law, if the appellant would take a few minutes to just briefly go over the facts of the case, I won't count it against your time. So. Um, also, when you step forward, if you would let me know um, how much, if the appellant would let me know, uh, Mr. Keplinger, how much time you want to uh, have for rebuttal. This is a 15 minute case. It has not been granted additional time. So, with that, if the parties would first just state their appearances, please. Uh, may it please the court, Bruce Keplinger, on behalf of Dr. Lentel. Okay. Please, the court, Mike Hodges represents the plaintiff, and the plaintiff is here as well. Okay. And um, Mr. Keplinger, did you wish to reserve any time for rebuttal? Uh, I'd like to reserve five minutes, please. Okay, so yeah. 10 and five? Yeah. And I'll uh, let you know if you're starting to. I don't want to quibble, but the, the docket says 25 minutes. Oh, does it? Ooh. Well, you're right. right. You mm -hmm. are absolutely right. Thank uh -huh. you. I can't read my own docket. You can so, cut me off whenever you No, want. we have plenty of time this afternoon. So 25 minutes. So how much? You went five minutes, so 20 and five. Okay, thank you very much for pointing that out. I was not looking for it to be in that location. Okay, so with that, Mr. Keplinger, if you would like to begin and give a little bit of information, please. May it please the court, as I have said, uh, I'm Bruce Keplinger, I represent Dr. Lentel, Michelle Lentel, an OBGYN, and this is a case having to do with gynecological care, uh, specifically and what's called an HTA, a hydrothermal ablation procedure done on, since I'm doing the facts, I almost want to be telling Yeah, that's this. fine. That's fine. I appreciate that. I'm sorry we don't have I don't want to turn my back on you either. So that's all right. Go ahead. You can explain. You might, you might be a little closer to that mic, though, since... Uh... Oh, okay. I'll just do it this way. <laughs> I'll just do it this way. Um, Can you guys hear him in the back? Yeah. Okay. If they want to. Uh, of course they do. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hydrothermal ablation uh, was done for Ms. Lundin because she'd had a number of years of uh, uh, abnormal uh, to the point of uh, needing to be fixed, uh, menstrual bleeding, that's called menorrhagia. And uh, there are several ways that doctors can ablate or basically destroy the lining of the uterus. And one of them is this device from Boston Scientific called hydrothermal ablation. And I'm gonna explain that in a little bit of detail because it, that dovetails into why we don't think Dr. Colton was qualified to be an expert. Um, so in the, the hydrothermal ablation device, after everything is done right, the design is that 90 degree Celsius water is circulated inside the uterus for 10 minutes, which takes care of the lining of the uterus and it is ablated and ideally the, the menorrhagia goes away. The way the device works, there is a 1,000 cc bag uh, and 1,000 cc, the court 
furnished me with my audiovisual device. <laughs> a thousand cc bag would be three of these together. But, um, but there's a bag, it comes down just by gravity through a tube and through a hysteroscope um, in, into the lady's, you know, through the cervix and into the lady's uterus. Uh, but inside the machine, which heats it to 90 degrees, there's less than a, a hundred cc's at a time. So there's never a thousand cc's of heated fluid. That's just, there's a thousand cc bag hanging there. And it isn't forced into the uterus, it comes in by gravity. The only pump that's involved is a pump that then removes the water from the uterus. It becomes a closed loop system and uh, this water circulates for 10 minutes. Before the procedure is started, the doctor does several things. She uses a uterine sound, which is a, a device with gradations on it to find out how deep the uterus is. The, the non-pregnant uterus is usually 10 to 12 centimeters, but the doctor needs to know how deep's the uterus. So that's the first thing she sticks in. Next is a dilator, which dilates the cervix to allow uh, further uh, devices to go in. Then a hysteroscope is introduced to allow the doctor to fiber optically look at the lining of the uterus, make sure there's nothing abnormal there which would contraindicate the HTA. And then finally, a curette is used to do a, a DNC, uh, dilatation and curettage, before the procedure. And that's what, on December 16, 2010. That's exactly what Dr. Lentell did. And uh, after all four of those are done, then there's what's called a cavity test with just normal temperature water where the system is run to make sure that the uterus is watertight. If the uterus loses 10 cc's of fluid, the system automatically shuts off. And in this case, Dr. Lentel did do the cavity test. After using the sound, the dilator, the scope, and the curette, the cavity test was passed, so the machine was turned on and the fluid started circulating. It's undisputed that nine minutes into the 10 minutes uh, procedure, the alarm went off. And following procedure, uh, Dr. Lentel, who was, had her hands busy, but she asked the, the helper from Mid-America Surgical Institute at 119th and uh, Nall to uh, turn it back on, which was done and it immediately, well, Dr. Lentel said it instantaneously turned back off. The nurse who was there said within two seconds it turned back off, and it turned back off. So Dr. Lentel stopped the procedure, re removed the hysteroscope that was in there. Um, I left out something. Uh, before the cavity test, this hysteroscope is locked in place, uh, and there's local anesthetic here for this reason, but by what's called a tenaculum, which are jaws, the hysteroscope is locked in place to the cervix so it can't move forward or backwards during this 10 minute procedure. So the tenaculum locks it in place. Well, when the fluid loss was noted, Dr. Lentel removes that one, uh, puts in a smaller hysteroscope and looks and sees that in the fundus of the uterus, the top of the uterus, there was a hole. So some of this hot fluid was escaping. So she stopped the procedure. She had a new bag of cool water uh, introduced and cool water was flushed into the uterus, into the peritoneum, but Ms. Lindeen nevertheless did have burn to part of her small bowel, which was surgically removed the next day. And she had other medical treatment that's all undisputed, but that's what the lawsuit was about. The initial, and I'm, I'm way past my, I'm in my time, I'm past no, my. No, I haven't started your time. I okay. told you I'd let you. <laughs> okay, well that's it. <laughs> okay, so now let's start. Okay. <laughs> okay. And Mr. Hodges, I'll give you a few minutes to give any counterfacts if you want. <laughs> yeah, we've already tried this case once, but we've okay. got a completely different set of facts. Okay, that. all right, go ahead. Well, so anyway, that... Um, I don't want you to think that I'm only listening to one side. Okay. No. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so... Um, By the way, as I understand, this was done at the Mid-America's... Uh, Surgical Institute. Which is an off, it, it's all, sort of on the uh, Menorah campus, but on the uh, separate building off on the side. But when, when Ms. Lundin was very appropriately moved into Menorah, they, even though it was like 100 yards across the parking lot, they still did it by ambulance. But right. yes, they're, they were adjacent. Dr. Uh, Lentel was working at Mid-America Surgical Institute. So the initial three, 
Suit was filed against three defendants, Boston Scientific, Mid-America Surgical, who made the machine, Mid-America Surgical Institute, and Dr. Lentell. And one expert was listed on behalf of the plaintiffs, Dr. Colton, who at the time was in St. Louis, uh, although now he's in California. Um, and Dr. Colton uh, is a gynecologist. He's a board certified gynecologist, but he testified in his deposition that he had never done an HTA procedure. He said he had seen one done once, but he'd never done one. And as you know, uh, Your Honor, uh, on qualifications for expert witnesses, the uh, Kansas uh, legislature has now adopted the Daubert standard for qualifications of experts, and the trial court is a gatekeeper to see whether an expert is sufficiently qualified to testify. And the defense challenged Dr. Colton as being improperly qualified and asked that he not be um, allowed to testify. At the hearing on our Daubert motion, the plaintiffs said, well, it doesn't matter that he hasn't done an HTA procedure because our case is that the perforation happened before the hot water even started. We're saying that with either the sound or the dilator or the first scope or the curette, he perforated the uterus then, and this machine was malfunctioning the whole nine minutes. Water was going into the lady's abdomen and peritoneum the whole nine minutes. That's our case, and Dr. Dr. Colton has used corrects and sounds and dilators and scopes thousands of times, and that's what he's going to talk about. So he's qualified, and, and Judge Moriarty denied our motion and let him testify. And at his, at his deposition, that's what Dr. Colton had unequivocally said. I believe that this perforation happened before the heated phase. He said, I believe strongly it was with the curette, which of the four things is the sharp one. So it would make sense for him to say that. But he said it happened before the procedure with the curette. But by the time of trial, Dr. Lentell was the only defendant left. And at trial, Dr. Colton testified, and well, I need to back up. Mr. Hodges chose to call Dr. Lentell as an adverse witness early in the trial. So Dr. Lentell had testified once at trial and once at her deposition before Dr. Colton took the stand. Uh, when Dr. Colton did take the stand, he had a brand new opinion, and we say an unfairly different opinion. Was the, was the doctor's testimony at trial that 50 cc's is all that had um, uh, gone into the abdomen, or oh, 50 cc's was all that was unaccounted for? Was that the first time she had testified that it was only 50 cc's? No. In her deposition, she had said, I can't tell you exactly, but it was a small amount. And of course, you know, at a deposition, she, can only, she only answers the question she's asked. And when she's called as an adverse witness, she only answers the question she's asked. But she'd said around 50 cc's, which would be one-sixth of this. And is it correct from that? 50, 55, okay, in, in that ballpark. Is it correct, though, that in the hospital report, um, she said, I mean, there's this 1,000 cc well, issue. Well, 1,000 cc, there's this bag hanging. Right, I understand that. And, it, and after the procedure, it was unaccounted for. So since there's a 1,000 cc bag unaccounted for, that's what she said, 1,000 cc is unaccounted for. But that doesn't you mean, mean the bag is unaccounted. I mean, none of that liquid was back in the bag? It, was, or it wasn't recorded. Oh, okay. okay. There could have been 700 left in the bag. There could have been zero in the bag. There could have been 900 in the bag. It wasn't accounted for. Okay. The bag could have been, I mean, the bag could have been gone. It just wasn't accounted for. So what she's saying is. Is the whole bag is the, unaccounted The bag wasn't accounted So we don't know. So that's just something we don't know. But she was definitely not saying 1,000 a a cc's went into the lady's abdomen. And she never said that at her deposition. So we don't, in fact, we're confident that Dr. Lentell did not change her testimony at trial. But nevertheless, Dr. Colton gave a whole new opinion claiming, well, I've now seen what Dr. Lentell said at trial, and this is all new. So whereas before I said that the machine malfunctioned, I no longer think it malfunctioned. Whereas before I said the perforation was before the heated phase, I now think the perforation was during the heated phase at the nine minute mark, nine minute and 20 seconds actually, by this scope. And our gynecologists, 
Dr. Brown, Dr. Aiken, and then of course Dr. Lentell said that's impossible because the hysteroscope is locked in place by this tenaculum and it can't move forward and perforate anything. But Dr. Lin Dr. Colton wouldn't know that because he's never done one. So our point was uh, two things about Dr. Colton and, and the rest is in our brief and then I wanna move on. But number one, he shouldn't have been allowed to testify at all because he didn't meet the Daubert standard. Judge Moore already committed error and let him testify. And of course, if his testimony is stricken, he's their only expert, so they don't make their case because this is a case where you need expert testimony. Uh, secondly, a subsidiary to that, uh, the Kansas rules of discovery were violated because uh, they, were, they never supplemented their expert disclosure. They never supplemented their interrogatory answers. Uh, we found out about Dr. Colton's 180 degree new opinion when he got on the stand and that's just unfair surprise at trial and merits a new trial just because of that. So that's what I have to say about Dr. So Colton. So if, it, let's assume for a moment that the plaintiff's theory is correct and that they were under the belief that there was a lot of fluid, not just a small amount or 50 cc's and didn't find out until trial that it was only, if you assume that that's true, would they ha have had the ability for the witness to, the expert witness to reevaluate his position? Well, uh, several things about that. The, 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 the difference in amount doesn't have anything to do with when the, per, when the uterus is perforated anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't see how it's even relevant to make him change his opinion. But um, so the only potential change would be before I thought that the machine malfunctioned and I lo no longer think it but malfunctioned. But wasn't the theory that he thought the machine had malfunctioned because a lot of fluid was was that, I, I tried escaping. to just say I yeah. tried to just say the same thing. Maybe oh, okay. I didn't say it okay. very well. All right. One change would be he would no longer be saying the machine malfunction. Right. But as far as did Dr. Lentel perforate it or when? So anyway, two things okay. on Dr. Colton and they in them themselves. Uh, well, if he should have been stricken by under Daubert, which we say should, that's we don't even need a new trial. That's directed verdict for us. But if you find that the rules of discovery weren't properly followed uh, in violation of uh, 6226 and 6237, then we ask for a new trial. Moving to well, what, uh, in the instance, uh, uh, if we assume for the sake of argument that that the expert's opinion did change, but it changed because of the uh, doctor's testimony, uh, and it changed at trial, then do you have any? I mean, obviously you can't, <laughs> I mean, it's too late to be supplementing anything. Uh, what, what's, the, what's the relief, or what's, relief what, what's, what's counsel to do in that kind of situation other than just put the- he's, he's, he's held to his expert disclosure and to his deposition, and he's not allowed to give a new opinion at trial when there's been no attempt to supplement. They, he gave a dep they gave a designation they gave a deposition, and the relief is we have a right to rely on that, and he should be, and that was my objection. Uh, I've, it's in volume eight, I think, of the record on appeal, but that's exactly why I said, Your Aunt, Judge Moriarty, he has to be held to his deposition. This is nowhere in his deposition. It's surprise. You can't let him say it. So he has to express an opinion that's really contrary to what he believes based upon the evidence that was, is now before him that was not before him earlier running out your hypothetical, which I disagree with. I, I said it was all Running out your hypothetical, yeah, yeah, that's was, if, if you accept the premise that I reject what you say, judge is correct. Okay. That, but I don't accept the premise. Uh, moving to instruction number four. Um, there was, and, and the fact that there were six parts to instruction number four is pertinent to everything else I'm gonna say. Um, Instruction number four gave the six ways in which the plaintiff claimed Dr. Lentell was at fault. The first thing I want to say about instruction number four is that the first specification of fault A and the last specification of fault F were unsupported by the evidence and shouldn't have been given. And the law is clear that if there's a plaintiff's verdict and one of the, one of the parts of the instruction shouldn't have been given, the, you, your honors, can't assume, well, they were relying on some other part. If, if A or F shouldn't have been given, then we get a new trial. 
and neither A or F should have been given. A said basically that uh, Dr. Lentel was negligent by perforating the uterus with an instrument. The problem with that is by the time the instruction conference had occurred, Dr. Colton had testified at trial, and of course the jury had only heard his trial testimony. They didn't hear his deposition testimony, and in his trial, he said one thing. She perforated it at the nine minute mark with the hysteroscope. Well, they heard your cross-examination of that, didn't they? You didn't let that go, and... I did say that... I mean, you, they, they didn't read the deposition, but they no, knew I, that I there was... No, I did say that he's changed his testimony right. at the trial. He said that the perforation occurred before the heated phase. So they knew there was a dispute about that, about... About when the perforation Colton's, occurred. About Colton changing his testimony. About when the perforation right. occurred. Right, right. I, as I recall, I didn't walk him through sound, curette, dilator, first scope, right. which is what this, so, and that's important because they only heard history, the jury only heard history scope. But to say instruments in the instruction is too broad because they had heard generically from everybody that at some time during the procedure, there's a sound, dilator, first scope, different scope, but first scope and curette. So they'd heard about these other things, and if some juror is thinking, oh, I've had a DNC and I've seen one of those curettes and they're scary looking things and I think she perforated with that, that would be running out the roving commission that Judge Moriarty gave them by saying instrument, and this was a specific objection I made at the time. Uh, what instruction A, or subpart A, just mirrors what was in the pretrial order, word for word, but the pretrial order was done when Dr. Colton had his first opinion. So, and then the second part is, at trial, Dr. Corton, Dr. Colton didn't say the perforation that was below the standard of care. He said failing to detect it was below the standard of care, so that's the second reason that A shouldn't have been given, there was no causation. F said that Dr. Lentel basically was negligent for turning the machine back on, but Dr. Colton gave no testimony that turning the machine back on for these couple of seconds or instantaneously turning off again, that that caused any damage. So there was no causation for F, even from their own expert. Um, Wasn't there some testimony that w it would have pushed hot saline solution further into the abdominal cavity? Or am I making that up? I, I would hate to say it that way. But <laughs> I don't believe there's testimony that way. The, the machine has turned off. And, and remember, that we're only talking about gravity here. The pump is taking out, not putting in. Right. So if it comes back on for two seconds, that's just two more seconds of, of gravity that may or may not have introduced any more fluid. We don't know. And remember, it's a closed system. I was thinking, though, didn't she put cooling or... She, that's, that's a different... That's, different. that's a different issue. Okay. Yeah. He, at his deposition, he also said, well, when she put in all this cool fluid, that just kind of forced the hot fluid further out. Uh, and he said something about that, but that's not what F is talking about. F is saying she should have stopped the procedure sooner. Well, in fact, you've got it in front of you. Right. That's, right. Okay. So F was unsupported on causation and shouldn't have been given. Um, so that's our, our third ground of error. The next two still have to do with those six parts. And, and this is where we, everything I've talked about so far is case specific. You, you can hold in our favor and make no new law in Kansas. But there is new law that needs to be made in Kansas. Uh, I should apologize for citing my own article that I wrote 33 years ago. Uh, but uh, it's our position that the same 10 jurors should, I guess I should do a little background again. Mm -hmm. Can I have a timeout? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, in Can you, we all know this, but they might okay. not. All right, I'll let you do that. In Kansas, in a civil case, not a criminal case, but in a civil case, 10 out of the 12 jurors, if 10 out of the 12 agree, then, then that's a verdict. You don't need all 12, but you do need 10, and that's the only time out. Okay, Just thank you. Back let on. them know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so uh, they had six theories, and Mr. Hodges, in his eloquent closing argument, pointed to the six things that he had up on a board, and he said, you know, you all don't have to agree on, I mean, a few of you can agree on this one, and a few of you agree on this one, and, a few, and we've got that transcript cited, and if a few agree on this one, and if, as long as it adds up to 10 of you, 
then that's a verdict. And we, we say that's just wrong, that's contrary to the legislative intent, and that's contrary uh, to what a real majority verdict means. As we did the math for you, there are six uh, allegations of fault. There are 12 jurors, so that's 72 possibilities. If Mr. Hodges is right, 10 out of 72 wins for the plaintiff. So if, to get a defense verdict, and we don't even have the burden of proof, we would have to get 63 out of the 72, or we lose. And he made, and, and he, he teed up this exact argument, and it's in the record when he pointed at those six things. So the law, in, and, and the, the law is not yet clear in Kansas on this, um, but we ask you to hold that uh, the plaintiff to win has to meet 10 out of 12 on a single theory. I freely admit that's not what the pattern instructions in Kansas say. On this part of the instruction, Judge Moriarty, word for word, and we call that pick, pattern instructions in Kansas pick, he precisely put what's in pick, but when it's applied to a case like this, we say pick is wrong, that you can't get 10 out of 72 and win, and, and another pernicious thing about this is we were comparing the fault, and I won't get into that, but we were comparing the fault of Boston Scientific because the evidence was Boston Scientific knew of prior incidents like this where there had been escape of hot liquid into a woman's abdomen. Under the FDA rules, they should have told physicians about this. They didn't. Dr. Lentell didn't know about the prior incidents, and she testified, if I'd known about any of these prior incidents, I would have never used this machine. But, and that, the jury put 40% of the fault on Boston Scientific, even though they were there as a phantom party. Um, and so, we, of the people voting for the plant, and that dovetails into one other thing, uh, and this has to do with more with the verdict form than instruction four, but it began, do you find any of the parties at fault, yes or no? And as presented, and as presented in closing art, Mr. Hodges, he said, if, if if you, even if you think only Boston Scientific is at fault, you answer yes. And we said, no, it has to say Dr. Lentell, because if, if, if 10 people don't think Dr. Lentell is at fault, we're done. But he said parties, and then Mr. Hodges said in closing, parties includes Boston Scientific, so if you think Dr. Lentell's okay, but Boston Scientific's at fault, you have to answer yes. And that's, that's how we go through the door and get into this 10 out of 72, and we just don't think this was fair to the defense. Um, and um, really the next point I, I've really already made, uh, that w we think that the law of Kansas should be for a 10 person, 10 person majority, that it should be the same jurors. 10 jurors have to agree to one allegation, and that's what the instructions should say. 10 or more of you must agree on at least one of these allegations or something like that. I think that's what the legislature really meant. Um, and I guess the fact that I said that in my article in 1984 is <laughs> not that relevant. Um, and, that, and those are all my points. That our last point having to do with the calculation of the monetary damages, I can't add to what we said in our brief. And so that's all I have for right now. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> As I understand, <clears throat> the, ess the essence of, uh, of Colt's testimony and of the and, and the pl whole plaintiff's case is that the uh, defendant perforated uh, the plaintiff's uterus and introduced fluid into the abdomen. And I guess um, um, I, my questions are very fundamental. Is there a time in the procedure when she? Uh, when this perforation could have occurred and it would have not been below the standard of care for the doctor. In other words, does it matter when it occurred? Yes, th that's why they did. <clears throat> if, I'm sorry, were you finished? Yes, no, that's, okay. uh, that's. If with the sound or dilator or scope or curette, she had inadvertently perforated the uterus, that would not be below the standard of care and it would have been detected during the cavity test when all the Would you say that over again? I'm just a little slower. Thank you. Sorry. I know, I know I'm over time. No, that's all right. No. I um, asked a question. You get to answer okay. it. Okay. <laughs> um, if prior to the heating phase, with, and it, it wouldn't have been with the sound, but just to be broad, with when the, the sound, the, the, the dilator, the scope, or the curette, she had inadvertently perforated the uterus, 
And by the way, if she had, it wouldn't have been at the fundus because it would have been somewhere else. But if she had, that would not be below the standard of care. And it would have been detected during the cavity test, the integrity test that's done before any heated fluid's even introduced. That's why they do the cavity test, because once in a while, there's an inadvertent perforation. Or once in a while, there might be a tiny opening that you don't really see it when you're looking in the scope, but it's there, so we introduce fluid, it starts to leak. And anytime you find that, you say, this woman is not the right candidate for uh, an HTA. There's another thing that's not part of this case called ThermaChoice, where you should basically do the same thing, except you have a balloon, and you're putting the hot air, hot water inside the balloon, and only the balloon has to maintain integrity, not the whole uterus. That's the device that Dr. Colton had, was familiar with, or had, had used there's, there's, Nova Shure, he, he used several, but ThermaChoice is one of them. All right. But to answer your question, no, it's not always below the standard of care, which is circling back to why instruction A is wrong, <laughs> for part A is wrong. But if, in fact, yeah. And then during the procedure, you can't perforate it. It's physically impossible because the scope doesn't move. It's locked in. And both the nurse and Dr. Lentell said it was locked in in this case and couldn't move. They had to unlock it to take it out to find the hole. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm done for now. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. You still have your five minutes Thank rebuttal. <coughs> Mr. Hodges, did you want to take any, uh, just a couple of minutes to add any facts? Yeah, I would. All right. <laughs> it's funny how you try these cases and you hear it so differently. Uh, <laughs> first of all, can you perforate with the hysteroscope? Yes, you can. The, he says it's locked in and you can't. Every bit of the evidence in the trial was you can. It's the only way. There is no other way. We tried this case on was it an exploding uterus or did the, she stick something through it? That's what this case was tried on. They had experts that said the exploding uterus theory. You know, I said, well, has there ever been an exploding uterus before? Not that we've heard of, this is the first. How does it always happen? We asked the rep, Diane uh, Fowler, how does it happen? It always happens when the doctor sticks something through it. That's the only way it happens. So uh, this idea that it can't happen and it was an exploding uterus, it was contested at trial by the experts. Uh, clearly, the jury heard evidence both ways and, and decided we were right. This concept that gravity doesn't force water in. Gravity is what makes your shower work. You raise the water up into a water tower high enough that it pumps through the, your system and it comes out your shower. So what they do is they raise the water to a certain height to create a certain amount of pressure to force the water in. So. When you're putting in 194 degree water, the one thing you're not supposed to do is puncture the uterus. That's, that's really your whole job as a doctor. Stand there and don't do anything. Just wait till it's over. If you move it and puncture something, that's below the standard of care. Now, do we care whether it was punctured by uh, the curette or punctured by the uh, camera that was in there or punctured by the uh, scope? Uh, the hysteroscope, well, we don't care. It never was the opinion that we cared the particular tool that was used. I met with Dr. Colton the night before the trial and made some notes of what his testimony was. And they're, six, they're right here. And we put it on the board the next day and the jury saw it and his opinion was Dr. Lintel perforated the uterus with a tool. That was his opinion. It's always been his opinion. Now, on cross-examination at the deposition and by Mr. Keplinger, it was, well, which tool? At what time? And originally he thought it probably happened early. Why did he think it happened early? He thought it happened early because Dr. Lintel wrote an operative report describing what happened. It's upside down. Oh. <laughs> I'd try, yeah. but... <laughs> uh, Mr. Kepler, are you okay with this? Yes. Yes, yes thank you. And the operative report, there, there's only two people that really know what happened. Brenda Lundy and Scott, when this was all occurring. There was a nurse standing there, and there was Dr. Lintel. And afterwards, Dr. Lintel wrote an operative report. 
she already knew by then that it had been a dramatically bad something happened. You know, this shouldn't happen. But what she wrote is up to 1,000 cc's unaccounted hydrothermal ablation fluid. And this idea that she meant, oh, the bag was lost somehow. Oh, well, wait a second. At the end of the procedure, you look around and you figure out where stuff is. And if the bag was lost, you'd say, well, you know, we lost the bag. This is the, this is the first time we've heard this story here today. There was no testimony in the trial that the bag was lost. It was, uh, so. There was testimony the whole machine was lost. The whole machine got lost uh, two weeks after this happens. And this is a machine that's kept in the hospital in a locker with part of it in one place and part of it in another place. And after this happened, somebody went in there who had access and took those two particular places and disappeared. It was a police report file. Uh, I don't know who, but we never got to check out the machine. There was sort of a claim uh, made that you know the machine must have failed in some fashion. And so, when, but anyway, this is where the thousand cc yeah, came from. So what do we do as a plaintiff in this case? We get the medical records. We look at them. We send them off to our expert, somebody who's uh, in this field, to determine what happened. And he says, well, let's see, a, a thousand cc's is lost. That doesn't fit with the story that it just turned on and off in a second, you know, that there was only a little bit. That's a ton of fluid lost. It's not on the floor, you know, it's not, it's unaccounted for in the body, is the theory. And so he goes, well, in that case, uh, the machine must have, uh, you know, not sounded when it was supposed to, because it's supposed to sound alarm if, if 10 millimeters is lost. So his opinion was, yeah, probably the machine didn't sound when it should have, but she should have known if you're losing 1,000 cc's, you know, it's a closed system. When 10 milliliters or 10 cc's are lost? It's ten, the same. Yeah. Same? Oh. <laughs> I showed my idiocy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, the, the system, the way it's supposed to work is if there's all the other, all the other uh, H, uh, ablation systems, <clears throat> you don't have this risk. In a balloon, the water just stays in there. Uh, you know, the electrowaves, it stay, you, know, you don't have to worry about these things, <clears throat> which is what, why almost nobody uses this. Even their experts. Dr. Brown tried it twice, said I'll never do it again. He didn't. Um, it's just not, because you have to be careful not to have this happen, you know. And so um, after Dr. Lintel came, the first time we ever heard this 50cc, the very first time, <coughs> was at trial. She didn't, took her deposition, nothing about CCs. I said, Did she say not very much during her deposition? I asked her, do you admit, because she wrote in another record, I don't have it right here, that there was a large amount. So there's a couple of records saying a large amount of lost fluid. And then uh, I, I believe it was in the report to Boston Scientific, she said there was a large amount. And so I said, do you admit there was a large amount? And she said, oh, you know, I don't really know how much it was. And then I said, well, do you admit you wrote a large amount? She said, well, there was a large amount, but I don't really know. Maybe it wasn't a large amount. So it was vague, what she said. But it wasn't, look, I'm convinced it was a small amount. I'm convinced it was 50 cc's, anything of that nature. So when she got on the stand and testified to that, I had the court reporter type it up, her testimony, and gave it to the, Dr. Colton that night. And I said, look at it and see if it changes your opinion. And he goes, well, it doesn't change my fundamental opinion. You know, my, my fundamental opinion is she departed from the standard of care by uh, perforating the colon. Whenever she did it, whether it was early, late, doesn't make any difference in my opinion. And I asked him at trial, does it make any difference to your opinion what tool did it? And he said, no, my opinion's the same. My opinion is it was below the standard of care to perforate the uterus. And, and it was below the standard of care to run that water into the uterus afterwards, making it worse. Those, and those were his fundamental opinions. And was he talking about running, turning the machine back on again and running more hot fluid, perhaps? Or is he talking about the cooling? Both. Okay. In his opinion, 
Both of those were below the standard of care. The appropriate thing to have done in the face of a perforated uterus was to go in laparoscopically right down and fix it. You don't, you don't uh, mess around with So did he say it's always under the standard of care to perforate a uterus? During a procedure? During the HTA with the with during the, hot the water, HTA procedure. With the hot water. So you're because still claiming the perforation occurred during the procedure, yeah. not before. Yeah. It, the, the testimony at trial was that it most likely occurred at the time of the when they say the machine went off. You know, we're stuck with what she says because she's Dr. Lentel, she's the only one that was there. So at trial, she said you know, it hadn't perforated before that. And she, she still claims that the uh, sudden explosion of the uterus, but uh, uh, the, the admitted testimony by Judge Moriarty was that it occurred during the procedure and that the hot water got out. And there's absolutely no doubt that enough hot water got out to cause her a serious scald injury of her bowel. And we had. Like uh, 50 cc's is like a teaspoon, right? We had pictures of her bowel at trial that showed inches of bowel, 21 inches destroyed. 21 centimeters. How many? Centimeters. centimeters thank you. As, as, <laughs> as Bruce pointed it's out, <laughs> as, as he pointed out in his brief, sometimes I have disdain for the facts. And really, it's not disdain so much as I get them confused. But that in this particular case, well, you you are a fisherman, aren't you? Yeah, I was. This is like a fish story. <laughs> in any event, it was a substantial enough injury to her bowel. We showed it at trial that it wasn't a, a quarter size or something of that nature. It was a significant bowel injury, indicating a significant amount of hot fluid scalding enough to scald her bowel. And there, there really hasn't been any argument that the verdict, uh, that the admitted evidence sub supports a verdict. The, the argument is it shouldn't have been admitted, right? And the two reasons he says it shouldn't have been admitted was, one, Dr. Colton shouldn't have been allowed to testify unless he actually chose to perform these procedures himself. Never mind that he knew all about it, knew how to do it, taught how to do ablations, had done thousands of ablations, was board certified in the field, uh, chose not to do it because he felt it was too dangerous to do. You have to go pick somebody who wants to take a chance enough, you know, to come in here and... Uh, uh, so I, on the qualification side, I think he clearly meets the Delbert standard. On the methodology side, he clearly meets it. Does the exact same thing that the others do, just comes to a different opinion. That is, review the medical records, review the literature, you, uh, base this on your education, training, and experience. And in the end, really, this case wasn't rocket surgery. You know, it was, uh, how do these things happen? How do you, at this time, get this to occur? Because they just, don't happen in a non-pregnant, non-cancerous uterus. They don't. Uh, and all the doctors admitted it, every single one. The, uh, then with regard to the, the uh, he says she reacted appropriately. Their own rules say if there's any, if the machine Is this, this was introduced? Yeah, this at was the introduced. Huh? And what it is is the troubleshooting guide, not warnings. But it was introduced. It's from the Boston Scientific Manual. Okay. And the, the basic idea of this safety alarm is if it goes off, there's 10 milliliters gone. Yeah. And, and we're assuming now, even though we don't have a machine, the machine worked okay. But there's 10 milliliters missing somewhere. Where can it be? And there's only really two places it can be. It could be burning the legs of the patient because it's come out the cervix, or somebody's perforated the uterus. Those are the two chances, those are the two places. So you need to know where is it, right? So it stops, and she looks on the legs, and the legs aren't burned. What does she do? In violation of this rule, and all common sense, she turns it back on. 
and then it's on for some period of time. They say two seconds. But the only evidence we have of two seconds is her testimony of two seconds and that of the nurse who was with her. But they did have an expert there, an right, um, engineer. And it, it said um, that there was 12 milliliters per second going out at the time that it alarmed. Okay? Or 12 milliliters per minute going out. So, minute. One sixtieth, what's the big deal, right? <laughs> Not per second, that'd be like that. Uh, uh, so I said, well, to get a thousand cc's into the abdomen, how long would that take? Well, I don't understand the question. But I'm not very smart, but I can start to do the math. If you're going to put uh, 12 milliliters per minute out, how, would it be two seconds? He said, well, no, it'd be a lot more than two seconds. Like what? You know, and it's like, I uh, can't remember the math right now, but it was 30 seconds or something in excess of it. So the, I think there's even evidence that, you know, the turning it on and turning it off, which their experts admit was wrong. Dr. Brown says, yeah, they shouldn't have done that. And, uh, and then in the end, it's sort of like we fight about these things and we miss the ultimate fact that well, of course there was a ton of hot liquid in her abdomen. Look what it did. It burned it up. You know, it's like, oh, we're going to act like because they said it was 50 cc's, that's all it could ever be. But wait a minute, it burned up her upper insides. And that was a mess. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, do you all have questions on the pick instruction and all that? Should I argue about that? Or, uh, yeah, you know, obviously, Judge Moore already followed the law on that. Uh, you know, the, the rule is you don't have to have everybody agree to every particular thing. And part of that is we'd never have a verdict in any case. You know, what is your response to the argument that it should have said um, if you find the doctor at fault versus anybody else. Yeah, that's not Pick. But the Pick says if you find any party at fault, and we fought Pick. But the real simple answer to that is if they didn't think the doctor was at fault, put zero on the blank. Okay. We find Boston Scientific 100% and zero for the doctor. And that's that's real simple. So uh, and, that, and that is Pick. Yeah. The um, let me, let me talk a minute about the caps. I don't know where we're going to end up on this likely, but I'll just say it anyway. And here, here, here's, you know, we've got, and it's actually Keplinger's case, you know. Uh, so uh, Mr. Keplinger started defending the case, I suppose, not too long after that happened with uh, Miller, right? And uh, That was tried in 2007, so it was, took a while. It was tried in 2007, and it happened, I think, in 2002. Uh, when it when the injury occurred, so that would have been the time that the caps would have applied. So that was literally eight years before Brenda's injury, and the Supreme Court in that case said, you know, we're troubled by these caps. We're troubled by the fact that uh, there hadn't been a raise in these caps all these years. So eight years goes by and there's no raise. Um, a difference is time has passed. You know, the Supreme Court in that case said the present value of Mr. Miller's econ non-economic loss was, I think, 147000 versus what it had been when they entered it. By the time Brenda gets there, you know, it's 40% or 60% of that. So, you know, 80000 100000 whatever, you, it's pretty small change money, honestly, you know, for somebody with a $2 million injury. Is there no hope for an equal protection argument? I don't know. You know, uh, nothing seems to have worked so far, you know, on this. But, uh, uh, you know, the legislature saw what the Supreme Court said and uh, did a tweak to it, you know. But uh, it just seems for somebody who's lost something worth, in the eyes of the community, $2 million, to now uh, be looking at a small fraction of it. And this court did say in that case, you know, you judge each case on its own merits. Uh, you know, and trying to, this, this, 
quid pro quo. What, what did we get, right? We got somebody who had insurance, required to have insurance. And in exchange for that, we give up 90%, you know, of the losses that we suffer. Uh, and uh, you know, there comes a point where it's just not fair anymore. Right? If it gets down to where you, okay, here's $10. You got $10. That's clearly not Just to, for the benefit of the students here, so there's a cap on non-economic damages of $250,000. And although the jury in this case awarded um, your client $2 million, the right. judge was required under that provision to reduce her award to $250,000. And that is unique to Kansas. So had she had a claim, had she had the same injuries in a state where it doesn't have caps, she would have gotten $2 million. Or against a different defendant. Or, or against a different defendant. A non-medical claim. Well, we have caps on all of them now, don't we? Well. Yeah, it used to be that way. Yeah, yeah It right, used to be yeah. that way. Now it's, uh, that was that, what was it, Samson or Samuels, uh, a case yeah, years right. ago yeah. where they... Sam Sell. Sam Sell, oh, you're yeah, right. you're that, right. uh, uh, thought it was a, Tom Sullivan's great idea and turned out to be a bad one, you know. Uh, but, yeah, so now we have it about everybody. But, uh, uh, and... So this is, I guess what I'm saying to the students is this is the effect of a cap on damages. When you hear them talk about caps on damages, the legislature talk about caps on damages, they place caps on non-economic damages. And in this case, the result was a $2 million jury verdict gets reduced to $250,000. This is sort of an ancillary point, but I'll just wrote it down, so I'll say it anyway. Uh -huh. With regard to where the fundus is. Uh, where the what? Fundus. Uh -huh. the, the fundus was the part of the uterus. Oh, where the. In this case, and it was directly, the testimony was, it was directly in line with where the hysteroscope would go. So it's the top of the uterus and the hysteroscope's going in the bottom. So you push it up and that, if you're gonna injure it with something, you could, the sound would hit the fundus, the hysteroscope would hit the fundus. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I, Bruce is my good buddy, you know, he, uh, <laughs> he, he uh, is a wonderful lawyer, he did a great job, he had good experts, he got a chance to cross-examine everybody, had a good trial, had a good judge, it was all fair and good, and I understand, uh, you know, there's always something to complain about, but I think, uh, I think he's gotten a plenty good chance at this, and I think that it's time to put this case to rest. So, are there any questions for me? Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Hodges. <coughs> I think I'll take less than five minutes unless there's questions. I'll do the the cross appeal first on the caps, um, and, and it's really quite simple. It, it, your honors have tremendous power, but you are neither the Supreme Court nor the <laughs> legislature. And Miller versus Johnson exists, and the statute exists, and uh, maybe you could make some dicta about what you wish happens, but Miller versus Johnson is there, and that's all I have to say. Well, on equal protection, uh, interestingly enough, of the, we were allowed 90 minutes for Supreme Court argument in that case, which tends to be a long time, mm -hmm. and I would bet 45 minutes of it were on equal protection, and it ends up being like 3% three, 3 of the opinion. <laughs> But, but the finding is that there is sufficient quid pro quo to support under equal protection, and, uh, and I'm not a constitutional law guy, so that's about all I can say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, getting to the facts of this case, uh, uh, four points. The last thing Mr. Hodges said about the hysteroscope going straight towards the fundus, he's talking, <laughs> here we go again, here we go again. Uh, <laughs> he's talking about the preheating phase, inspect the uterus hysteroscope, the hysteroscope during the procedure is just what the fluid, it has a little camera on it, but it's mainly what the fluid comes out the end of. So by definition, it can't be up against the uterus or it's not, fluid isn't gonna come out. So that's point one. Uh, and then, and on Dr. Colton's theory that she perforated the uterus, um, nine minutes into the procedure by the, his, the, the hysteroscope that fluid's coming out of moving. Uh, I've said before that it was locked down, but what I forgot to say is, and Mr. Hodges is right, 
Dr. Lintel was just standing there at the nine minute mark. She did not have hands on this thing. So unless, she's, unless she can move it by telepathy, she just could, and, but Dr. Colton would not know that because he's never done one. Um, and was that brought out to the jury? Yes. Nine minutes, he, she, yeah, the, the nurse, Vern, her first name was Vern, V-R-N-E, I'm blanking on her last name, but both nurse, it's in the record, nurse whoever, Vern, and Dr. Lentell said, nobody was touching the hysteroscope when the alarm went off. That's why the defendants said this was a spontaneous perforation. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, once you've eliminated the unlikely, whatever's left, how, the impossible, whatever's left, has to be the truth, and that's what this is. But Boston Scientific did have evidence of spon spontaneous ruptures before, they just didn't tell anybody. Um, and, and that was Dr. That Dragonich was said evidence. that, that was Dr. Dragonich, just... our expert against Boston Scientific, Dr. Dragonich said that, PhD, Dr. Dragonich, not physician, right? Uh, and then last thing, minor. So the, con so the consistent verdict would have had to have been based upon turning the machine back on at that point? To well, if there was any evidence that turning it back on itself had caused damage, which there wasn't, Dr. Colton specifically said to me, and Mr. Hodges hadn't covered it, did turning it back on cause any additional damage? No. He said the initial escape caused damage. He said introducing fluid later caused damage. He's wrong about that, but he said it. But he didn't say turning it back on caused damage, and 4F is turning it back on. Last point, and then I'll be done. Uh, and, it, and it's a minor point, but since Mr. Hodges brings up the water tower and hydraulic pressure and all that, that's why the instructions, I don't know if it's this page, and it's centimeters. The, the bag is 45 centimeters above the uterus. They have it on a pole and they adjust it and based on the lady's size, they because they want just that amount, which is not much, of hydraulic pressure. So it's not like a water tower and you taking a shower. Not a very good analogy. Well, one of his original uh, claims uh, of negligence wasn't it, the, that the bag was positioned too high? That was back when they were a defendant. <laughs> They weren't a defendant at trial, and we don't need to get into why. Well, I'm sorry, was that, was that Dr. Oh, Col the oh, that was the Boston Scientific's? No, the Colton, Colton Dr. Theory. Colton, when he was giving opinions against Mid-America surgery, surgery, said that yeah, the yeah. staff put the bag too high and caused too much pressure, and that's why the uterus came apart. Of course, that would be a preheating phase. Right. And so then the other part would be, and it must have been defective because water escaped for nine minutes without the alarm going off. That's what he said at the deposition. And, but that was, that was not his testimony at trial. <laughs> Absolutely not at trial. He said, nothing wrong with the machine. This was all Dr. Lentell at the nine minute mark with this hysteroscope. But we ask, that we ask for the relief as prayed for in our brief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Um, students, I just would like to say you've been very fortunate today. You've heard two of probably the best litigators in the county um, on these types of issues argue before you today. So I, um, I think you've been very fortunate. We will get an opinion out as soon as possible. We'll take the matter under advisement at this point. Um, at this point, we do have a few more minutes. If anybody, we cannot answer questions about this case or any case we've heard today, but we do like to give the students an opportunity to ask any questions. Council, you're free to stay or leave, whichever you want. If you are willing to answer questions from students, I'm sure they might have some for you. Not about the case, though. No. Not about the case, and you can stay to make sure that happens. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's always looking. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Any questions? Anybody would like to ask us or the litigants here who've decided, to, the attorneys who've decided to stay? <laughs> yes. What firms do you guys represent? <laughs> Might get Nobody some business. will hire him. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my own. This is Mike Hodges. is a Hodges Law Firm. And uh, this is my son, Alex. He's in law school. And hopefully he'll be uh, doing this before too much longer. Well, congratulations, Alex. You're going to go to work for Mr. Keplinger? Keplinger <laughs> <laughs> and I have actually been buddies since we are 18 years old. So uh, it's kind of fun to have. Uh, <laughs>
We do engineers and architect defense. This is what we call design professionals and health professionals. This is the health professional. I'm talking about the case So, uh, <laughs> is one of my paralegals, Trish Carlisle, uh, and Emily Tung, one of our lawyers. Uh, and that's who we are, if that answers your and many of the students here are paralegal students. So were you in this program, paralegal program? No. OK. Yes, sir. Could there be any risk of conflict of interest since you do know each other for so long? Because <laughs> you know, this, this, we all come, this all started in England. And, and we would be what would be called barristers in England, where uh, they, you know, you're out in the room and uh, they call you in, and in the morning he's prosecuting and I'm defending, and then in the afternoon I'm prosecuting and he's defending, and, we're, and then we all go out for drinks together and know each other, and that's the system that came down to us. So, the, and, and uh, we actually do play it straight, even though uh, we know each other. Uh, and so that is not a conflict of interest. If, if, if he, but there is, and, uh, are you, you guys are all too young. Does anybody remember the Hyatt Skywalk disaster? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, when the, Sky, Hyatt, when the Hyatt Skywalk disaster happened, several lawyers were killed, in the, in the, and then several firms, even though there wasn't a real conflict of interest, said, we don't want to defend anybody because our friends just died, and they didn't take the case, and you know, I hope he lives forever, but we're good enough friends that if he ever got hurt, and somebody was suing somebody and they asked me to defend the case, I wouldn't do it because he's too good a friend of mine. So in that sense, there would be a conflict. I think a lot of times people say, well, you know, this is, this is just a good old boy system because look, after trial, they're both at the bar drinking or they're both having dinner together. But really, being an attorney is a profession, and they're hired to do a particular job, and they do it to the best of their ability, and it, nothing is personal in the whole matter. And they're a good example of how that um, can continue to be. And when you're in a community like Johnson County, Kansas, um, or even the metropolitan Kansas City area, which isn't that big compared to many around the country, you're gonna come in contact with the same attorneys, the same judges, again and again and again. So. Um, you know, people don't let their personal relationships get involved with their professional it's, position. This is another, and there's nothing wrong with this. Judge Moriarty, who was a trial judge in this case, and I go to the same church. Have we ever said one thing to each other about any case that I have in front of him? Absolutely not. Because we all know how to, mm -hmm. we all know how to do that. Probably one of the joys of practicing in Johnson County. We've got a, a large, diverse bar, but it's not so large that we lose track of, uh, 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 we, we make friendships in the bar. We've all made professional friendships. <clears throat> I've tried, as a lawyer, I've tried cases with both these guys. Consider them fine lawyers, <laughs> super lawyers. Uh, this guy uh, would beat me on cases that are, he had no reason, no justifiable <laughs> reason to beat me on. <clears throat> uh, uh, but we all put those things aside and uh, and uh, have have professional friendships that uh, uh, that never that never interfere with uh, our ability to be good advocates for our clients. And I would say it's similar on the court. I mean, the three of us will sit together and decide these cases, and there are 14 members of our court. There are times all of us have been on various panels and have fought valiantly over particular issues that we thought were the right way to decide a case. But we remain very good friends and it never gets personal and we never um, be bemoan one of our colleagues for taking a position that we disagree with. One of the most wonderful things about being on a court of appeals is you get the input and ideas from two different judges to help you come to the right um, decision with all different experience backgrounds. So it works the same in the judicial branch. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Did you say that the briefs, for the sound like I'm not familiar with the court rules, so I don't know how restrictive they are, but would you say they're pretty standard for around here, like in length and style? Because they're very different from the ones, the briefs. 
Oh, I didn't know that work, but most of what I do is related to other states. So I didn't know if that was a you mean the, the jurisdiction the thing or it was just they different. Read, what you, the briefs that we sent to them? <laughs> yeah, they got copies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> how, how is it different from other states where you've seen? Well, it's shorter. These are shorter? Quite a bit. <laughs> the ones that I encounter, a lot of what I encounter is either Florida or Massachusetts well, New York. Are we have a have limit of 50 limit. pages. <laughs> yeah. They have a 50 page page okay. limit, and I think I came pretty close to it, actually. Well, I'm one of those people that does come a lot closer. They would agree. <laughs> I tend to go a lot closer to the limit, and I didn't know if that was standard. Well, they had several complicated issues in this case that would make it go a little more than 50, but you know what we often say is it's a lot harder to write short than it is to write long. <laughs> We actually need to get going. So. Oh, okay. Feel free Sorry. to. Sorry. Yeah. Have you, ever, have you ever seen that old TV show, Columbo? Mm -hmm. Well, that was based on Hodges. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how he, that's his MO, and he does great. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. So, you know, we can't really speak for other. Point of curiosity. Because we don't, despite that I work in Kansas City, Missouri, I don't really do anything with local. Stuff. Yeah. So. yeah. We have a 50 page limit. Other courts have other limits, other things they require in their briefs. Do you see a lot of paralegals when you track cases or when you hear cases? Like, do you see a lot of I mean, we uh, see paralegals come with their attorneys mm -hmm. that they work for for argument, something, and the paralegal will be there often to. Um, you know, if we ask something about, well, is it in, is this in the record? The paralegal will be over there trying to find it in the record so that when, for example, Mr. Hodges sets down before he gets up to give rebuttal, the paralegal will have found the site for him. So there are, you know, any attorney during trial or during oral argument has lots of things they're trying to think about at the same time. So it's helpful to have somebody there to, I mean, would you? Yeah, I think almost always now at trial, everybody's got at least a paralegal. You know, like bigger firms might have a couple, you know, two or three, but like even a small firm like me, I'll have a paralegal there. You know, it may be that you need to make sure you introduce this exhibit into evidence. And so you've got a paralegal sitting there to check off when you actually introduce it because during a trial, you have thousands of things going on, and that paralegal can just be there to make sure, okay, you got that in evidence. Or if not, he can say, Ms. Mr. Hodges, don't forget you didn't inter ask to have that introduced. So little things like that can be a godsend to an attorney, I or think. organizing the witnesses. You know, there's somebody out in the hall, or, you know, you're always got to have a wit next witness, so somebody has to go out in the hall and, you know, make sure they're there and call them up and say, where are you? You know, there's a lot of that, too. Better than being the young associate in the firm. That's that's the one <laughs> who carries the box of exhibits around and who has to park the, the partner's car at the courthouse. <laughs> Other questions about how they use paralegals or anything? Yes, Mr. Nader. The Court of Appeals use paralegals. Um, <laughs> we have no money. If they would like to work for free, I suppose we could find something for them to do. Well, we have judicial executive assistants, and some of them have paralegal training. Um, so we do have um, assistants that help us. For example, I mean, I'll tell you kind of the process we go through. Um, before our case, uh, before we come in here on this case, we have both the briefs that we've read of the parties, and we also have a pre-hearing memo that's been done by a research attorney, a lawyer, who's kind of summarized the issue, checked to make sure every time Mr. Hodges says that this fact occurs on, that the thousand cc's occurs on this page, we can go back and check that page and make sure, or the research attorney will check that site and make sure that's right. They'll check the case sites to make sure that when the attorney says this case stands for this, that, that's correct, that case does stand for that. They'll uh, do some other summarizing for us. Um, before they give that to us, uh, many judges will have their judicial assistant also check their pre-hearing memo and check all those things again. And so that would be somebody that could be a paralegal that would check all those sites again. When we come to oral argument, make our notes, go back and discuss, decide how we're going to rule on the case, whichever one of us is assigned to rule on the case, we'll go back to our office and start writing. 
once we finish writing our um, uh, opinion, then this judicial assistant will take it again and we'll go over and make sure that everything we've cited is correct, make sure that every record, we've still got record sites in there and make sure every record site is correct before they go in and then take those out to refer it to the panel so that they can be assured that every factual thing in there is correct. Um, then it'll go to the panel. The panel will decide whether they agree or not or want this change or this th change. It'll go back to the judicial assistant again to, again, make sure any changes that are made are correct, cited to the record. Then it will go to our um, reporter's office, who will again fly spec the opinion to make sure that the sites are correct, the record is properly cited, um, before it actually goes out on Friday for um, publication or goes out as an unpublished opinion. And all of our opinions you can find online beginning at 9 o'clock every Friday, both our published and our unpublished opinions now. So. Um, our general rule is to get an opinion out within 60 days of oral argument. We are able to do that in about 95% of the cases. So 60 days from now on a Friday, check your um, uh, check online to see if um, this case has come out or before 60 days. Um, but it generally takes, for that whole process to take place, it generally takes about 60 days. Sometimes it takes longer than that. Um, if there's a disagreement and one of us is going to write a dissent, that may add some time to the whole process. But so there, I mean, there are lots of roles, and some of these judicial assistants do have um, paralegal background. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We have thoroughly enjoyed our visit here today. We will be back tomorrow for three criminal cases. <laughs>